Um, basically, textbooks have been written about it. Um, countless talks uh, have been uh, have been illuminating all of the errors of our ways, uh, and still, all this sucky software is out there. Um, but Fifa over here, the hero of our show, uh, has put out to, uh, has put all of these best practices into you know into his work to try to create a um, secure website. He's going to show us how it's done so that we can all sleep way better at night and um, um, and with that template go back and and secure our own software. And so with that, I'm going to hand it right over to Fifi. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I have to start with an apology because I did submit this talk, but it was rejected, so the slides are not at the stage where they should be. These are our slides for a previous version of the talk. It contains all the material, and I tried to update it more, but they destroyed the flow, so we're, we're stuck with it, basically. Um, the difference was the, the audience, so while I expect more developers here, the other audience was more hackers and business people, so I tried to get them from where they are, and uh, the main question usually is, are we there yet, right? So about me, you've probably, probably seen this before. I'm a code auditor by trade. I have a small company, and companies show us their code, and I show them bugs I find in it. It's quite easy. But before we start, I have a small celebration to do. This actually happened just a day before the first time uh, I talked about this, uh, it was a Kaspersky message. They found some malware and it used Diet Lipsy, which I have written, so this is like a knighthood. <laughs> some of the malware people know what's good. So um, basically, the main question when I talk to customers is, uh, we, we spend so much money on this, why isn't it working? And the, the answer is you're, you're doing it wrong. So um, I will try to show now what exactly is wrong. And uh, there's a, a small preface here. Uh, people usually say there's no time to do the sprite, and that's just wrong. You have exactly as much time per day as other people who did great things. So you can do great things too. You just need to do it. So let's play a little warm-up game. Uh, it's called How It Started, How It's Going. So let's have a demo round. IBM Watson is revolutionizing 10 industries. And it's uh, going like this. Whatever happened to IBM Watson? That's a typical pattern in the security industry. Right, so here's another one. How It Started, revolutionized security with AI. Right, we all know where this is going. <laughs> right, so that's the pattern. Um, let's play IT security Minesweeper. Right, so uh, everybody here probably knows who Gartner is. They uh, publish recommendations, and they even have a voting section where people can say, this is the best product in this section, right? So let's look at a few of them and see what happened to people who trusted Gartner. First is a firewall, right? So how it started, the number one recommendation is Fortinet. And they have a, a lot of marketing gobbledygook. And uh, if you look how it's going, it's not going so good. So uh, let's extend the pattern a bit. Why, what happened to me in, re in this regard? So I, I don't need a firewall. I don't have any ports open that I need blocking, right? So you don't need this. Strictly speaking, you don't need it. Next discipline, endpoint protection. So it started with Trellix. This is the number one recommendation on Gartner. I, I hadn't heard of them. They're like a McAfee joint venture or something. Who cares? They also have great marketing, goobly goob. And then if you look at what happened, it's like, they made it worse. Um, okay, so this didn't apply to me either because I don't use snake oil. Mm, let's see the third one, password manager, also very popular. How it started, recommended last pass, you probably know where this is going. <laughs> yeah, they got owned, and then people got owned. So um, you may notice a pattern here. Uh, this didn't apply to me because I disabled password authentication, use public key, which has been available for decades, right? So 
Small bonus, the last one, 2FA. Uh, Gartner recommends Duo, which has been bought by Cisco, but doesn't matter. So if you look at what Duo does, your server asks the cloud for permission. The cloud goes to the telephone, the telephone shows a pop-up, you click yes, and then the cloud tells the server it's okay, you can let him in. If you look really closely, you can notice the cloud doesn't have to do the pop-up, can just say, sure. So this comes pre-owned, there is no need to hack anything here. <laughs> and something many people don't realize, you don't need two-factor if you have public key, that's already the second factor. Okay, so, yeah, let's skip over this briefly. Splunk is the, the recommended option here. And they make the organization more resilient um, unless you install it. <laughs> okay, um, so this one is dear to my heart because um, people start arguing about whether to install patches and which patch to install first. And uh, it used to be simple. You, you look for problems, then you install the patches, and then it got a bit more complicated. And the result is this, right? That's a famous podcast in, in German. Uh, it's about a municipality who got owned by, uh, by ransomware and then had to call the army for help. And what you should do, I'm having this for completeness, install all patches immediately, but that's a separate talk. Right, so um, you may notice a pattern here. The IT security industry recommends something, and if you do it, you're fucked, so don't do it. Um, in case you can't read this, this says snake repellent granules, and then there's a snake sleeping next to it. <laughs> right, so um, if we can't trust the recommendations of the industry, what shall we do? And um, so I had a lot of time on my hands because I didn't have to clean up after crappy IT security industry recommendations, so what did I, what did I do with my time? And uh, I decided I need a blog uh, some time ago now. Um, and I started thinking, what do I need? And it's actually not that much. I could have just shown basically static content. A little search function would be good, but it's optional. Um, I didn't need comments for legal reasons because people start posting like uh, links to malware or whatever. I don't want that. Um, I don't need that. Right. So the first version was actually really easy. It was a small standard web server, and I had the, the blog entries as static HTML files, one file per month. It was actually really easy. If you want to search, you just can ask Google and limit it to my site. So. Posting was also easy, I had a little script that uh, I could run on the server and I just SSH in, and SSH I trust for authentication, so there's no new attack surface, I have that anyway. And this is a great design. It's secure, it's simple, there's low risk, it's also uh, high performance, but you couldn't do a talk about it at the CCC, right? So it's too boring, so I started to introduce risk in my setup. So the first idea was I had written a small web server, I could just implement the blog in the web server because, you know, it's my code anyway. Um, but that has downsides. If the, the blog is running in the web server, then it can access all the memory of the web server. In particular, it can see the TLS private key. And that I don't want people to extract, right? So it can't be a module in the web server. And the, the obvious solution is it, the, it has to run in a different user ID on, on Linux. I'm using Linux. Oh, but any, any Unix or Windows would be the same. Basically, it runs in a different user ID. And then if you, if you take over the process of the blog, because there's some bug in it, you couldn't access the, the TLS key. And while I did that, the industry was doing this. That's like the running gag of this talk. I show all kinds of interesting things the industry did and then show what I did in, the, in that time, right? So, um, next question, where's the content? I could just have files on disk, like static HTML as before, but I think that's not professional enough, right? So, for a good CCC talk, you need to be more professional. Also, for a different project, I had just written an LDAP server, so I uh, decided to reuse it. And uh, while I did that, the industry did this. I, I took this photo at the airport of Jerusalem. So this is an actual ad. It's not photoshopped, right? It's for Northrop Grumman, which is a, um, a military contractor. And it's about full spectrum cyber across all domains. 
So why would I write my own LDAP server? Mostly because it's small and um, because I'm an auditor by trade, I know that if you want a chance to actually audit the code, it needs to be small because that's a limited resource, the time you can spend on auditing code, right? So Postgres is a common SQL database. Uh, SlapD is the, the open LDAP implementation of the server and tiny LDAP is mine and you see it's much slower, uh, much smaller. Yeah, so there was more to this ad campaign. I collected a few funny images. <laughs> right, so um, if someone manages to hack the blog CGI or whatever module I use to, to have connect the blog to the web server, they can open any file that the blog can read, right? The UID can read. So um, I should probably do something about that. It was the next step. And the industry was starting to think about vulnerability management. So there is a mechanism on Unix, on Linux. I did a separate talk about that uh, on the last Congress. It, it's called SecComp, and SecComp can, it's like a firewall for syscalls. So I can use SecComp to block open, the open syscall, which is used to open files. Um, but if I have to use open myself, then um, I can't block it, right? So what to do about that? For example, my block calls local time, which converts uh, Unix time into the local time zone, and for that it opens a file containing the description of the uh, system time zone. And that's, that calls open, right? So if I just disable the open system call for my blog, then it couldn't do the time translation. And uh, this is actually an old problem that also uh, applies to set UID programs and has, has applied to them for decades. So uh, what you can do is you can reorganize your code. So before you block or before you drop privileges, generally speaking, you do uh, the open calls in this, in this example, um, and then you disable open, and then you f look at the, the data provided by the attacker, because if the attacker or any untrusted source is trying to hack you, it is via data it gives you, right? It's the, the environment is compromised. So you look at what kind of uh, elements in the environment are attacker supplied, and before you look at a single byte in them, you do all the dangerous stuff if you can. Right? So in this case, I call local time once before I drop uh, the open syscall and then my libc will cache the, the time zone data and the next time I call it after I have looked at the, the attacker supplied code, there is no need to call open. Right? So that's a major advantage of SecComp over uh, similar technologies like SE Linux where the, all the, 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 the um, prohibitions on syscalls are applied to the whole process. So there is, uh, this is an example and you should make use of it. You should look at your process and you can see if you have the source code at least, you can see which parts uh, do I need to do before I can drop privileges and you move them up, right? So that's what I did. Um, this is actually uh, a mock-up from the Estonian Cyber Security Center. So th this is real. Okay, so um, next thought. So let's say someone hacks the blog uh, module and someone else uses the same module but supplies a password. Right, this is a common problem in websites. Uh, in websites there's some kind of login, something you get, maybe a session token or whatever. Um, and if someone manages to take over the, the middleware or like the server component, they can see uh, all other connections too, if they are handled by the same process. Right, that's a, that's a major problem um, and you can do something about it. So that's the good news here. Uh, and in, in my example, it led to me using CGI instead of fast CGI, which is fast CGI is, is a newer version of CGI and the idea with fast CGI is that you don't uh, spawn a new process for every request, but you have like a Unix domain socket or another socket to a fast CGI process and that opens maybe a thread per request or something. But um, usually in fast CGI you try to handle the requests in the same process and then you can use that process to cache data. So there's a perf advantage to using fast CGI, but for security reasons um, I, don't, I don't use fast CGI, so I can't do caching. 
right? So that's a major downside, and you would expect the block to be really, really slow in the end. Um, so first thing, I need to use CGI instead of fast CGI. And secondly, you could still use debug APIs. So if you use GDB or another debugger to, to look at another process, they use an API called ptrace, uh, but that's a syscall. So I can use seccomp to disallow ptrace. If I do those two and the attacker takes over a blog process, all they can see is the data they supplied themselves. Right, that's a major advantage. Okay, so Inisa is actually in the EU agency, which I find really disturbing because they're burning lots of taxpayer money. Anyway, so let's assume um, the attacker can hack my blog. They can still circumvent any access control I do in the blog. So, for example, if I have an admin uh, site or some login site uh, part of the website um, and it's handled through the same program, and the access control is done in the block CGI, and someone manages to hack my block CGI, they could just skip that. So um, it's really hard to do access restrictions that can't be circumvented if you do them in your own code. So the solution is not do it in your own code. Um, I don't do any access restriction in the block. I do it in the LDAP server. So if you connect to my blog and supply a password, then the blog doesn't know if the password is right or not, right? There's an, 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 for example, there's an interface where you can add new blog entries or you can edit an old one. And for that, you need to supply credentials, but the blog CGI doesn't know if they are right or not. It opens the connections to the LDAP server with that credential, and then the LDAP server says yes or no. So since we uh, removed access to the ptrace syscall uh, and the, the processes are isolated from each other. That means there is nothing to circumvent here. So if someone hacks my blog, the only advantage uh, they get is they can do the exact same stuff they could do before, basically. They can just talk to the LDAP server. Okay, so I'm starting to get into uh, James Bond territory here, right? With the attacks, they're getting more convoluted. Right, so the industry started doing threat intelligence features which are useless, don't spend money on those. Okay, so let's say the attacker hacked my blog and then went to my tiny LDAP and now is attacking tiny LDAP. Then they can watch other logins because tiny LDAP handles connections from other instances of the blog too, right? So the same problem we had before, we just moved the goalpost a little. Uh, and we need to prevent this and the, the, the obvious solution is to do the same thing we did with the blog. Um, we have one process of the LDAP server per request. And then we disallow ptrace, right? So now you can't watch, even if you get code execution inside the LDAP server, you can't watch what passwords other people use. You can still see, okay, the industry does some bullshit again. You can still see the password in the LDAP store, right? So the LDAP server has to have a version of the password to authenticate against, and the industry practice, best practice is to use salted hashes. So you, the password is not actually in the store. Still, if someone manages to attack tiny LDAP through the blog, they can extract the hashes and try to crack them. But since I'm the only one adding users, I can control the password complexity. So good luck brute forcing that, right? OK. <laughs> So uh, this is actually a real problem, not, not for my blog specifically, but for other web services or services that are reachable from the internet. What if an attacker doesn't want to steal my data, but it wants to encrypt them? Yeah? So the ransomware. What can you do about that? And um, my idea was to make the data store read-only. So the LDAP server has a data store that contains all the blog entries, and that's read-only to the LDAP process. It can only read from it. And if you want to write to it, for example, to add a new entry, it gets appended to a second file, which I call the journal. So SQL databases have a similar concept, and they use it to, to roll back transactions. I can do the same thing. It's basically a log file. And that means um, all the differences from the last time the store was created, the read-only store, all the differences are sequentially in the log file, in the journal. So that, that the performance gets worse uh, the bigger the journal gets. So every now and then I need to combine the read-only part and the journal to a new bigger read-only part, and I do that manually. 
um, because tiny LDAP couldn't do it because I didn't allow tiny LDAP to write the store, right? That was part of the security here. And uh, so um, with seccomp, I can't just disable whole syscalls. I can also install filters. So I can say open is allowed, but only if you use oappend. oappend in the open syscall on Unix means every write you do to this uh, descriptor is automatically added to the end. So I know if someone manages to, to access the tiny LDAP binary and can write to my journal, then the only place the changes can show up is at the end. And that's actually a really good, good thing to have because it means if someone hacks me and adds junk to my blog, I can only remove at the end and I'm good again. Compare that to a usual SQL database. Um, if someone wrote to the database, you need to, in, uh, in, to, to play a backup uh, in, to restore a backup, because they could have changed anything anywhere. Right? So, but TinyLDAP doesn't even have file system level permissions to change anything in the store, so I can re re uh, sleep soundly. Yeah, the industry spent money on cybersecurity mesh architecture. Right. So, the journal integration has to be done by me manually out of band. So, it's not something an automated process does. Um, I do it manually. And when I'm doing it, um, because it's not that much data, it's like for a week or two, I can just read it again and see if something doesn't look right. This may not be available to all other scenarios, but uh, you have to realize if you have bigger data, it's usually not all the data that's big. Most of it is usually static and read-only, and then you have some logs that are, or you know, billing data that grows and grows. But usually, uh, there's part of the data, and this is the the part with the you know um, uh, identifying information, personally identifying information, or you know, the bill, billing details. That stuff is usually small and mostly static, and you could use this strategy for that too. Well, yeah, okay. So the attacker can still write garbage to my blog. That's still not good, right? But since all they can do is append to the journal, I can use my text editor, open the journal, and truncate at some point. And then I get all my data back till the point where they started polluting the blog, right? This is still bad, but it's, it's a very good position to be in if there's an uh, emergency, because you can basically investigate calmly. First you turn off write access, then you, you delete the vandalism in the journal, and um, you know you haven't lost anything. Because if you want to delete an entry in the blog, you could do that too, but that means at the end of the journal you append a statement saying delete this record, and I can just remove that and I get the record back. Right. So there's no way for someone vandalizing my blog to uh, damage any data that was in it before, all they can do is append junk at the end. And I can live with that. Right? This, is, this is, should be the guiding uh, thought between any security you do. Um, if someone hacks you, you will be in a very stressful position. The boss will be behind you, breathing down your neck. Are we done yet? Is it fixed? And you want to have as little to do as possible at that time. You want to, to move all the stress to before you get hacked. Because then you have more time. Okay, the industry did other things again. Um, so what if the attacker doesn't write garbage to the journal, but writes some exploit to the journal that the next tiny LDAP instance that reads the journal gets compromised by? That is a possibility, and that would be bad. So agreed that is still a problem, but uh, realize how preposterous the scenario is. So we are talking about an attacker who found a, a stable zero day in the blog and then used that and another stable zero day in tiny LDAP to write to the journal and then have the third, uh, third zero day to compromise the, the journal parsing code. So I mean, yes, it is still a problem, but we reduced the risk significantly. Uh, and that is what I'm trying to, to tell you here. Uh, it's, not a, it's not all or nothing. It's good enough if you can halve the risk. That's already very important and you should do it. So as much as you can uh, slice off the risk, the better, the better off you will be if something happens. Right, because the smaller the code is that is still attackable, the more you can audit it and be sure it's good. You can show it to your friends and they can audit it too. 
uh, and, and you need to save yourself that time because it happens every now and then that I get to get to see the whole code base. And the usual code base for commercial products is like gigabytes of source code. Nobody can read that. Like, I'm, I'm good, I'm not that good. <laughs> So um, this is a good place to be in, I think, right? So the industry was selling DDoS mitigation, sure, whatever. So what happens if someone attacks the web server? That is still a big problem. Um, and it's actually, uh, it, it's a full damage, right? That's the worst that can happen. If someone manages to attack the web server, they can see all of traffic coming through. They can look inside TLS secured connections and they can sniff all the passwords. So that's really bad. Unfortunately, there is not too much you can do about that. Um, you could do uh, um, a separation. So this is something people have been talking about for a while. OpenSSH is doing this. They moved the dangerous crypto stuff in a second process and use sandboxing to lock down that process. Uh, that could be done, but nobody has done it for OpenSSL yet, so OpenSSL doesn't support that. Um, my web server also supports embed TLS, they don't support that too. So I, I could spend time on that and I've been actually um, spending some time already, but it's not, it's not ready yet. But this would be a good way to reduce the risk. And you may notice that the, the tools I'm using to reduce risks are actually just a handful. There's not, it's not, you know, it's not witchcraft. I'm, I'm not inventing new ways to look at things. I'm doing the same thing again. I'm identifying the part of the code that's dangerous, and then I think about how I can make that part smaller. Maybe put it in a different process, lock it down. So we need to do the same thing with the web server, obviously, um, but it's an ongoing process. Yeah, so, again, okay, whatever. Um, why haven't I done that yet? Uh, so in my web server, you can, it's a build time decision if you want SSL support or not. And you can see the binary is significantly bigger if you have SSL. I'm showing you this because it means the, the bulk of the attack surface is the SSL code. It's not my code. So if I, if I can put the SSL code in a different process, they still need to see the, the private key because that's what TLS needs, the private key. Otherwise, it can't do the crypto. So the bulk of the attack surface would still have access to the key. I can still do it because there might be bugs in my code and not the SSL code, but that's just 5% of the, of the overall attack surface. So um, it, I will probably do it at some point, but it's, I don't expect miracles from it. Bugs in OpenSSL will kill, kill me. There's not much I can do about that. <laughs> okay, so I know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> what about kernel bugs? <laughs> so I looked at a few of the recent kernel bugs and uh, it turns out that they usually apply to syscalls that are rarely used in regular programs. And uh, because I'm blocking all the syscalls I don't really need, none of them apply to me. Right? And this is a, this is a, a pattern with kernel bugs. Um, uh, there is a, a project called Sandstorm. Um, that also uses ptrace uh, and, and seccom tracing to reduce the syscall uh, surface and then puts regular services into a sandbox for, for web services and they uh, evaded all kinds of, of kernel bugs just because of that. So this is like a zero effort thing because obviously if you have a list of syscalls, you'd use a whitelist and you, you have a list of things you are explicitly allowed and the rest is, is disabled, not the other way around, right? So none of the usual kernel bugs apply to me uh, because of the, the SECOM stuff I already do. So kernel bugs aren't as big of a problem as you might think. At least I still have them if I haven't patched, but you can't get to them via the blog. So I have a small confession to make. Uh, I'm a bit of a troll and that applies to this project as well. So um, I use the worst programming language. <laughs> I use C, right? So I'm trolling the security people. And then I'm trolling the Java people who have been saying you should use multi-threading for performance and not have one process per request. So I'm doing actually two fork and XX per request. Um, I'm trolling the database people. I don't have any caching. I don't have connection pools. And the perf people too because I'm still faster than most of the regular solutions. So there is no, there's really no downside if you, if you architect your software to use this kind of thing. Um, it will be slower than other ways to do it, but most other software isn't as fast anyway, so 
there's enough headway that you can use to do security instead of performance, you will still be faster. So let's recap the, the methodology I used. Um, first, I make a list of all the attacks I can think of. And this means concrete attacks. So what could happen and what would, what would be the problem then? Right? And then I think for every item on the list, I consider how to prevent this. Can I prevent this? Uh, what would I need to do? And then I do it. Right? So that's easy. It's like this, the fine man problem solving algorithm in spirit. And this process is called threat modeling. It's, it's like a, it's a dirty word because it, it sounds like there's effort involved and nobody wants to do it, but it's really, it's easy. It's just these, these steps. You, you look at your software, you consider all the ways it could be attacked, and then you consider what you could do to prevent the attack, or in some cases you can't prevent the attack, and then you say, well, that's a risk I have to live with. Right, so that's called threat modeling. You should try it, it's awesome. And um, you saw that I'm trying to optimize something here. I go for a specific target. In this case, I want uh, as little code as possible. Um, the more code there is, the more bugs there will be. That's an, a very old uh, uh, insight from, I think it was originally an IBM study, and they basically found that the number of bugs in code is a function of the lines of code in the code. So there's a little more to it, but basically it's true. So. Uh, and it's not just any code I want to have less of. Um, if the code is dangerous, I particularly want to have less of it. And the, the, the most important category to, to make smaller is the, the code that enforces security guarantees. So like one security guarantee would be you can't log in if you don't have the right password. Right? So the code that checks that, I want it to be as small as possible. Um, one or two lines of code if, if I can manage it and then it's obvious if, it, if it's wrong or not. The more complex the code is, the less, less easy will it be to see if it's correct or not. And that's what you want in the end. You want to be sure the code is correct. So how far did I get? It's actually pretty amazing, I think. Um, you can write an LDAP server in 5,000 lines of code. The blog is uh, 3.5 lines of uh, kilo lines of code, um, plus the LDAP client library, plus uh, Zlib. Um, but I'm only using Zlib to compress, not to decompress. So most attack scenarios doesn't, uh, don't apply to, to my usage of Zlib. Um, and the web server is also pretty slow if you only look at the HTTP code. Unfortunately, uh, it also contains the SSL library, which is orders of magnitude more than my code. And that's how you want it. You want the biggest risk not to be in the, the new code, but in, in old code that someone else already audited, if you can manage it. Right, so this is the optimization strategy. Try to have as little dangerous code as possible. Sounds like a no-brainer, but if you look at uh, modern software development, you will find out they do the exact opposite. Pull in as many frameworks as, as they can. So this strategy is called TCB minimization. You should try it, and I gave a talk about it already. It's actually pretty easy. So. Um, I told you what I did to the, to the blog to uh, uh, diminish the danger that can be done uh, if someone manages to take it over, and this is actually part of the TCB minimization process. So the blog was a high risk area, and then I took away privileges and removed access checks, and in the end, even if I give you remote code execution in the block process, you can't do anything you couldn't do before, right? So it's no longer part of the TCB. The TCB is the part that uh, enforces security guarantees, which the block CGI doesn't anymore. So that's what you want to do. You want to end up in the smallest TCB you can possibly manage, and uh, every step on the way is good. So no step is too small, right? If you can shave off even a little routine, do it. This is the minimization part of TCB minimization, right? I, could, I was able to remove the block from the TCB. Tiny LDAP still, still has a risk. So I, I, you saw the threat model. If someone manages to take over tiny LDAP, they can read the hashes and try to crack them. That's still bad. Um, but I can live with it, right? Uh, if they vandalize the block, I can undo the damage without going to the tape library, so that's good. If you compare that to the industry standard, you, you will find that my approach is uh, much better. 
Um, usually in the industry you see platform decisions done by management, not by the techies, and um, it's untroubled by expertise or risk analysis, and you get a diffusion of responsibility because if you, even if you try to find out who's responsible for anything, you find, uh, well, it's that team over there, but we don't really know, and then you find out the team dissolved last week, and it's really horrible. And brand new, we have AI tools, which is also a diffusion of responsibility. And then you get people arguing, well, it's so bad, it can't get any worse, let's go to the cloud, where obviously it gets worse immediately. So I prefer my way. Um, I think in the end it's important to realize that the, the lack of security you may have in your projects right now is self-imposed. There is no guy with a shotgun behind you threatening. You can do it, you just have to start. Right, so this is self-imposed uh, helplessness. You can actually help yourself, you just have to start. Right, how did we get here? This is obviously not a good, th good place to be, like all the software is crappy. And there's a few, it's not just that people are dumb, there's a few reasons for that. So um, back in the day, you used to have bespoke applications that were written for a specific purpose and they used the waterfall model and you had a requirement specification and it was lots of bureaucracy and really horrible. But it also meant that you knew what the application had, be, had to be able to do. So that means you can make sure anything else is forbidden. If you know what the application needs to be able to do, you can make sure it doesn't do any other stuff. And that is security, if you think about it. Deny everything that the application wasn't supposed to be doing, and then that's what an attacker would do if they take over the machine, right? So if you know beforehand what you're trying to get to, you can actually implement least privilege, even architecturally, as I've shown you. Now we have more of an IKEA model. You buy parts that are uh, designed by their own teams, and the teams designing the parts don't know what the final product will look like. Right? In, in some cases, even you don't know what the final product will look like. But it's even worse if you consider that the, the, the team building the part you make your software from doesn't know what it will be used for, so it has to be as generic as possible. Right? The more it can be done with it, the better. And that's the opposite of security. Right? Security means understanding what you need to do and then disallowing the rest. And this means be as generic as you can. The parts are optimized for genericity. Gen what's the name? Gen Genericism? I don't know. So it, they are optimized to be as flexible as possible and they are chosen by flexibility. The developer of the part usually has no idea what it will be used for uh, and that means you can't do least privilege because um, you don't know what the privilege will be that's least. So this, this is actually a, a big mess. So if you use parts programmed by other people, you will have to invest extra effort to find out what kind of stuff you can make it not do. Because it will definitely be able to do more than you need. And the more you can clamp down, the more security you will have. Uh, it's even worse if you do agile development because then by definition you don't know what the end result will be. So. <laughs> If you don't know that, you can't do security lockdown. So another argument why we got here is uh, economics of scale. So it used to be that if you build some kind of device that needs to do something like, uh, I don't know, uh, a microwave, then you, you find parts and you combine the parts and you solder them together and then they solve the problem. But these days, uh, you don't solder parts anymore, you assemble from pre-made parts, and these are usually programmable, right? So a in, in little ARM chip costs like a tenth of a cent, so why use a special part if you can use an ARM chip and then program it? But that means you still need to use software that actually solves the problem. The hardware is generic, and that means the hardware can be hacked. And this is turning out to be a problem, right? For if you had a break in, in 20 years ago, um, it, it breaked, right? But now it's programmable. And people haven't realized how bad that is, but it is bad, right? So that's, that will bite us in the ass. Oops. So um, the response from the industry has so far been the ostrich method. Basically, we, we install stuff that we know is untrustworthy, and so we install other stuff on top of it that's also untrustworthy, and then we call it uh, telemetry or big data and do some risk uh, logging analysis in, in a Zeme or whatever. 
uh, and in the end, the attack surface has mushroomed like uh, a nuclear explosion, right? So that's our fault. Nobody has forced us to do this. You don't need to do this in your own projects. That's the hopeful message of this talk. In conclusion, if you remember nothing else from this talk, remember that threat modeling is a thing and you should try it. TCB minimization actually helps. Least privilege is another facet of the same thing. And if you can uh, use append-only data storage, you should consider it. Hmm? Blockchain. Yeah, not blockchain, append-only data storage. <laughs> it's not blockchain. <laughs> So, two more. You two more slides? Yeah, two more slides. Sorry, I'm an so, imposter. No problem. So the rule of thumb should be if, if the blog of some unwashed uh, hobbyist from the internet is more secure than your IT security, then you should improve your IT security. Right? That shouldn't happen. All right, so that's all from my talk. If, I think we still have time for questions, do we? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, now you can put your heads together. So, if you want to ask a question, we have four microphones in the room. One, two, three, four, and I'm going to take a, a question, the first question from the internet. The internet is saying, you actually got hacked, or can you elaborate on what happened? <laughs> yes, uh, actually there was an incident where someone was able to post stuff to my blog, and because I had append-only data storage, I shrugged it off, basically. So, use, use append-only data storage. It's, it will save your ass at some point. The, the problem was a bug in my uh, access control lists. I had used some, some uh, access control lists in my LDAP server, and I had a, a line in it that I should have removed, but I forgot to remove it, and that meant you could post without having credentials. But um, it happened, and it wasn't bad, because my architecture prevented damage. Um, as people are leaving the room, could you leave very quietly? Thank you. Um, microphone number one. Yeah. Is there a second alternative for Windows and Mac OS? A secure alternative? Well, so basically you can do the, the principles I, um, I showed in this talk, you can do on those two. So usually you will not be hacked because your, your Mac OS or Windows had a bug. I, that happens too, but the bigger problem is that the software you wrote had a bug or that you, the software that you use had a bug. So I'm, I'm trying to tell you, Linux isn't uh, particularly more secure than Windows. It's just, a, it's basically, you can write secure software and insecure software on any operating system. You should still use Linux because it has advantages, but if you apply these techniques to your software, it will be secure on, on Mac OS and Windows as well. Right, so this is not for, for end users selecting the software. If you select software, you have to trust the vendor. There's no way around that. But if you write your own software, then you can reduce the risk to a point where you can live with it and sleep soundly. Sure. Is there a, a technical alternative or a similar, similarity like SecComp for Windows and Mac OS? So can you drop your privileges after you have opened a file, for example? Uh, uh, so for macOS, I'm not sure, but I know that, that FreeBSD, NetBSD, and OpenBSD have an, an equivalent thing. I think uh, macOS has it too, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. For Windows, there are sandboxing methods. You can look at the Chrome source code, for example. They have a sandbox. It's open source. You can use that to uh, do this kind of thing. Okay, thanks. So microphone number two, except oh, no, that's gone. So uh, microphone number three in that case. <laughs> This is four. Uh, sorry, four, four, yes. Um, <laughs> will your next talk be about writing software, in, secure software in Windows? And if no, uh, how much assets would you request to compensate for all the pain? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not a question of money. <laughs> okay, uh, microphone one. Um, have you tried removing unnecessary features from OpenSSL? Uh, yes, actually, I've, I've done this pretty, uh, pretty early, but it's still, it's still much bigger than my code. So, um, for example, uh, OpenSSL has support for UDP-based TLS, uh, but uh, there's a lot of shared ciphers in there. You can remove ciphers you don't need, and, and that helps a bit, but it's still it's the biggest part of the web server by far. I think there was an internet question, was there? No, it doesn't look like, yes? No? Yes, no, no, yes. Okay, uh, then microphone four. 
As someone who is uh, connected or was connected to an industry which has programming, programmable breaks, um, <laughs> what is your opinion about things like Misra? Well, well, so there are standards in the automotive industry, for example, like Misra to uh, make sure you write better code and it's mostly compliance. So they give you rules like um, you shouldn't use recursion in your code, for example, and uh, the functions should be this big at, at most. And this is more, I mean, it, it will probably help a bit, but uh, it's much better to, to invest in, in good architecture. But you may have noticed I, I said I wrote the code in C and I said nothing about what I did to make sure it's, it's good code. So that's, that's a different dimension that's orthogonal, right? So follow those standards. It will, it will make your code a bit better probably, um, but it won't solve all the problems. And I think personally you should do both. You should make sure or try to make sure that there's as little bugs as possible in your code. There's ways to do that. I had to talk about that too. But after you do that, you should still have these kind of architectural Guide, guardrails that keep you on track, even if someone manages to take over the process. So now I think there was an internet question. Yes, uh, the internet is asking, how, would it work to like scale this truly impressive security architecture up for more use cases and more like larger team, or would the team size and the feature keep ruin it? Yes. So, uh -oh. hello, hello. Oh uh -oh. no! Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. 